So one of the things I wanted to cover in this video series, we're talking a lot about cover crops and regenerative agriculture and the fact that that's what we're doing on this farm. And naturally this is a new thing, we're on a learning curve, and I'd like to talk about a challenge or a failure that we've had this year. Um, you know, to quote, to quote Gabe Brown, if you're not failing at something every year, you're not trying hard enough. Or perhaps if you prefer uh, Joel Salatin, anything worth doing is worth doing badly first. So, um, first shot here is for comparison. This is a field of soybeans that's looking pretty good under the current system. These were no-tilled in this spring, and um, they have done quite well in this field, I think, given, again, the weather conditions this year. It's not a bad-looking soybean crop for us. This is just off of our driveway, and these beans are drying down now. The leaves are coming off of them. Uh, this was the first field we planted, and uh, there, there is some, some weed pressure in here a little bit, but it's really not bad at all. And, uh, you know, these are some, some fairly good looking beans in here. Um, I don't know what the yield is going to be. This is only a six acre field, so, you know, even if it's a good yield, we aren't going to get a ton of, ton of uh, crop off of this. But this was a good, good way to, to jump into no-till farming and, uh, and uh, using regenerative practices. This was following a cover crop too. We planted green into this. So, okay, so that's our good example. Now I'm gonna take you to the not so great one. All right, so here we go. In a second, I'm gonna turn the camera and you'll see what I'm talking about. This is our not so great example. <clears throat> this is 18 acres of soybeans that were no-tilled, same as the other field. They were no-tilled about a week later than that field. Uh, because we, we faced some mud and rain in between the two. And uh, this is not great. This is full of ragweed, mostly ragweed, common and giant. And uh, there's a good, good chunk of water hemp in here too. Um, so it's, it's not good. This is gonna be hard to combine and the bean yield in here is not gonna be stellar. This was the field that we were sort of counting on for the bulk of our soybeans and I guess we'll see what happens. But what do you do with this? I guess the answer from this is that you learn from it. Okay, so I'm up on a hill here where we can see this a little bit better. Um, how did this happen? How did we get all this ragweed and other various nuisance plants uh, established in this field of soybeans? The answer is a lot of these are resistant to spray. Um, we uh, we did spray this field. We hit it with Roundup, uh, Dicamba, and a couple of other things. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what the spray mix was because in the past we have just relied on our local co-op to come out and custom spray for us. They bring out a big high boy sprayer. Uh, it's quick, it's easy, you call it in. They've already got the cocktail figured out. They do it for you. That's something that's gonna have to change after this year. Uh, one of the downfalls of regenerative agriculture, of doing no-till, of using cover crops, is there's increased management on the part of the farmer. If you're not well versed in your herbicides, if you, if you don't understand the modes of action and what weeds are resistant, then you have to study up on it. It's a thing that I've been working on this summer to the best of my ability with limited time. This winter I'm really going to sit down, I'm going to have to really study my herbicides brands, types, modes of action, and get acquainted with a lot of it and, and start asking around for what works with other people who are doing this system of agriculture in our area. Um, the big problem here is that we are following this soybean crop with a cover crop and we could not use most of the recommended pre-emerge chemicals on here. Um, we have used pre-emergent herbicides in the past. They've done a good job for us. It's been a few years uh, since, we, since we employed one and we were developing a ragweed problem. We knew we had it coming. It's just that it was never this bad. And we had pockets of it last year and the year before. And then all of a sudden it was like we hit that critical point where it just took over. So Dad and I have two different ideas about how to do this. He's, again, a little more traditional. He would like to uh, buy a new variety of beans next year that's going to be resistant to 2,4-D. Um, so that we can use 2,4-D on these fields. Most of our weed problems are broadleaf weeds, so that would work for us. Uh, I missed the point here with the pre-emergent. 
most of the pre-emergents have a residual time that would prohibit following the field with a cover crop. Some of them, it's unclear, especially it really depends on what you're going to use as a cover crop. Cereal rye, for example, which a lot of people use, is said to have a little bit better resistance to some of those pre-emergents if they're still persistent in the soil. But it's a risk because if you plant that cover crop and that pre-emerge is still active and your cover crop fails, that's quite a bit of money you put into seed now that was all for nothing. If you apply it to the ground and it doesn't come up, what's the point? You've just thrown a bunch of money away. So my idea on this would be to increase our rotation on the farm to have a third crop. We've talked about planting teff grass. Uh, we do grow some hay here and sell it as small square bales to various horse people and small time cattle people in the area. There seems to be a good market for that. I think if we could make more hay, that'd be good. So if we could plant a teff grass in our rotation, be able to cut that three times a summer, that would knock back some of those annual weeds, decrease the seed bank in the ground, and then follow that up the next year with either corn or soybeans. Probably soybeans if, I'm, if we did it the way I would picture it. Um, Dad's not so keen on that because that involves more hay baling in the summer and that comes with its own challenges as far as making good hay. So he would like to take more of the chemical approach and I would like to take more of the rotational crop uh, approach to dealing with this problem. And uh, I think that if, if we went my way and if we did the rotations, we would be able to get then a successive two years, one of corn, one of soybeans with at least much decrease, decreased weed pressure, if not minimal weed pressure, uh, before that kind of started to recover and then we'd follow that again with another annual hay crop. Um, another possible solution is to get some livestock on the farm and start to devote certain parts of our cropland to grazing. Give it a rest period, do some rotational grazing, use that to try to knock back the weeds and decrease the weed seed bank out there. As for this year, there's nothing we can do anymore at this point except combine it uh, struggle. Hopefully that combine can handle the weeds. Um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. And then, you know, next year there will be corn in there and we'll be able to spray 2,4-D on the corn and uh, interseed our cover crop into the corn crop. That might help decrease the weed pressure some. I'm also hoping that over time the no-till methods will change the nature of the soil and make these these parts of our farm less conducive to these weeds. Uh, I've been told that will happen, but I don't really have a good guarantee of that. So eh, it's still up in the air. What else can I say? So as a quick addendum to the video that I just put together, um, I mentioned that one of the downfalls of regenerative agriculture was an increased requirement of management on the part of the farmer. Um, I don't want to make that sound as bad as it did in the video. Uh, it, it's ultimately a good thing. It, it's just that if you're a conventional farmer and you've been kind of on autopilot with your corn and soybean rotation using the same kinds of herbicides and fertility program every year, you won't be able to do that anymore if you switch to more regenerative style practices. Um, you're going to have to think ahead. There's going to be more diversity in your rotation and, and different plans that you're going to need to come up with. Um, you have to be able to take those things into your own hands and start to think uh, more creatively about those types of things and explore a lot of different options that you hadn't really considered before. Um, so, so it's more work, but it's necessary, and once you start to get a grasp of that, it gives you a lot more freedom and creativity with your farming practice. Um, I, I love the fact that we're kind of on the cusp of that now and moving into that for the next year, I'm hoping. Um, we can talk about lots of other positives that go, go along with this kind of uh, uh, system of farming, but this video was about challenges and problems, so we'll save the positives for another time and we'll leave it on a very pessimistic note. <laughs>